thank you everyone um, who is um, attending um, and thank you for interesting the events and I also want to really thank our speakers today who obviously have um, taken the time to explain you know their, their participation or their um, engagement with um, European funding and hopefully that will be an inspiration to you um, I guess um, to yeah um, to also um, take part in these opportunities that are currently open and also the ones that will be opening up in the future as well. Um, I wonder if Jamie maybe you wanted to um, um, well, actually, yeah, maybe I will just say some, some housekeeping rules. Um, so obviously, um, this webinar is recorded. Um, uh, you can, you've got the option to um, uh, post questions um, throughout the event. And uh, the slides um, will also be shared uh, with everyone who's attending. And also, if, you know, um, you know, anyone who hasn't attended actually, but has registered, but if anyone hasn't um, been able to join, we will be sharing the um, recording and the slides as well. Um, and I think otherwise it's pretty basic um, Zoom etiquette um, and I think there probably wouldn't be an option for you actually to um, unmute or share your um, camera anyway um, so it should make it quite easy for you as participants just to um, I guess sit back and relax and enjoy um, and maybe now I will then hand over to Jamie just to introduce um, the event. Thank you very much Annie. Um, hi I'm Dr Jamie Davis, a Senior International Partnerships and Engagement Manager at the Arts and Humanities Research Council for the United Kingdom. Um, it's a pleasure to have so many people here today and see so much demand for collaboration within the uh, cultural and creative sectors across uh, Europe. Um, this is the second time we've done a joint event with DCMS and the UK National Content Point for Cluster 2 following on from an event last year and really um, the key message here is, is around promoting the opportunities for research collaboration uh, through EU funding um, through Horizon Europe, uh, especially for the cultural and creative sectors. Um, in the past, there has been criticism about the, the, the space for culture within European research. However, it's fair to say that within Cluster 2, there are significant opportunities for cultural and creative sectors. And it'd be a shame for, for, for uh, cultural and creative sector organisations to miss out on those opportunities and to miss out on the opportunity to collaborate with EU partners. The UK has got huge strengths in the cultural and creative sector, um, whether that's through um, Arts and Humanities uh, AHRC investment or DCMS investment. And it's really good to see um, both organisations working to promote the, the EU funding opportunities available that UK organisations and legal entities can apply for. And really, that's the message today that, that you can apply for these opportunities and that you should be brokering opportunities with, with partners, existing partners or new partners, existing or new partners, sorry, um, from across Europe within the cultural and creative space for the calls that are currently live this year, but also thinking about the next uh, round, which will be opening next year as well, and or, or, or potentially sooner. So, um, yeah, thank you once again. We've got a fantastic range of, of presentations today, whether it's uh, practical advice about the calls that are currently open and, and how to apply for them, or um, as well, we've got um, speakers from people who have been successful in the past as well, from a range of cultural and creative sector organisations. And hopefully what we'll, what we'll show to you, and, and, and there's over 200 people attending today's call, is that there's opportunities for brokering and, and, and putting in applications, whether you're a small, medium or large uh, cultural and creative sector organisation, whether you're a gallery, whether you're a museum, whether you're an archive uh, service or a library, there's huge opportunities for you here. Um, and please, Use, use a day as a way to sort of spark your interest and enthusiasm for the opportunities, but also to potentially find partners as well. And throughout the day we'll, or throughout the afternoon, we'll be, we'll be putting in the chat opportunities for how you can find partners, um, as well as how you can potentially encourage your colleagues to take advantage of this opportunity. I'm going to hand over to now Benedict from DCMS. Thank you, Jamie. Um, hello and welcome, everyone. Um, to briefly introduce myself, my name is Ben Scalian, and I, as Jamie mentioned, I work at DCMS, uh, UK Government. I'm here today in my capacity as um, Programme Committee Lead for Culture and Creative Sectors for Horizon Europe, specifically uh, Cluster 2. Um, and just on behalf of DCMS, I'd really, really like to thank UKRI and AHRC, Jamie, Annie, etc., for helping to convene this afternoon's session. Um, we work together in many different ways, but uh, one is this is the real priority for DCMS is around kind of presenting Horizon Europe to, to uh, all DCMS sectors. Uh, I briefly want to acknowledge the work of, of, of uh, a separate department in the UK government, BASE, who have done all the kind of hard work in the background to ensure that uh, Horizon Europe is still uh, open to uh, UK applicants, in particular the recently announced guarantee scheme. Um, at DCMS, we really we work across the arts, culture, heritage, uh, creative and digital sectors. 
the really the breadth of, of, of the organization we're talking to today. Uh, our mission is to drive growth, enrich lives, and promote the UK to the world. From the arts to tech companies, a quarter of UK businesses are in these sectors, and we are among the fastest growing in our economy. It is, the, it is these cultural and creative organizations and businesses that we want to encourage to apply to Horizon Europe. As many of you will know, Horizon Europe is probably the largest research development program in the world um, with a budget of you know, nearly 95 billion. Um, it is this kind of R&D potential which we really want to encourage smaller to larger organizations to apply for, particularly as we emerge in a pandemic uh, in this kind of, at this particular moment. Um, not, 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 not only can Horizon Europe really foster kind of research and innovation in the UK, it also encourages collaboration with uh, European partners, research institutes, etc. Something which is, is more apparent and more important than ever. So I, it's really encouraging to see so many people from across Europe on the call today. Um, crucially, Horizon Europe allows for UK organisations who don't necessarily have IRO status to apply. And it's these small organizations really re we, that we would love to reach out to today and encourage you to share this information um, from right across the UK to think about accessing Horizon Europe funding. And as Jamie said, this is really a chance just to try and get some sparks flying, uh, get you excited in Horizon Europe and to kind of reiterate the message that it's open and uh, ready for your application. Um, without really any further ado, I don't want to kind of take away from all the really interesting case studies we have today. But just to say a final thank you for coming. Please do spread the word and um, back over to you, Annie. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, um, Jamie and Benedict. I think that was actually really nice kind of setting the context and the scene um, for European funding um, in, in these sectors. Um, and also, you know, I hope that the yeah, wide range of case studies that we've got um, can really help to um, address some of those aims and objectives that we have. But um, I think, uh, like Benedict said, I also don't want to take away too much time from um, our brilliant present, uh, presenters later on. So I will just, you know, uh, pr provide a brief overview of Cluster 2 um, and the kind of opportunities specifically for the arts, heritage and creative industry sectors. Um, so um, um, I am Andy. I am the UK National Contact Point for Cluster 2 um, called Culture, Creativity and Inclusive Society. Um, and I'm delivering this presentation um, together with my um, colleague, Jamie from AHRC. Um, and I obviously already said that we've got a Q&A session at the end, um, so do uh, feel free to ask questions throughout. Um, and also there is the um, hashtag UK in Horizon, so if you're from the UK, that would be quite useful for um, promotion of your activities, but also just for finding out more information and inspiration from other projects and activities. So just to, you know, briefly explain the European Framework Programmes. Um, so these are funding programmes for research and innovation. Um, they last for seven years. And the current program is called Horizon Europe, and its budget actually makes it the um, largest transnational research um, and innovation program in the world. So that's quite exciting to have access to that. Um, new opportunities are published um, in these documents that are called um, work programs, um, and they contain um, core topics. Um, core topic is what a single funding opportunity is called. Um, and a call um, in, in the European language would refer to like a broader call area that then includes um, multiple call topics. Um, and of course, to address um, the UK eligibility, um, the UK is associating to Horizon Europe. Um, so UK entities will have associated country um, status and UK entities will then have um, virtually equivalent participation rights um, to those from EU member states. And UK entities can also lead um, projects as coordinators um, and also, um, uh, I think Benedict already mentioned that um, there is obviously the guarantee scheme um, for anyone who um, you know, is successful and if there is any, um, uh, yeah, any delays in terms of the um, 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 kind of finalization of this association, um, UK um, entities uh, will be able to take part um, in projects. Um, so this is the main structure of Horizon Europe. Um, obviously we focus on pillar two. Uh, which covers um, collaborative um, challenge-led funding um, and this is divided into clusters so these are research themes and we are uh, fo focusing on the second cluster which is culture creativity and inclusive society and i also wanted to let you know that we did organize uh, a first webinar in the series last year um, and that provided a bit more information about um, some of the other areas outside of um, cluster two 
Um, so for example, in pillar one and pillar three, um, so you can access, access a recording um, um, through this slide um, when, when we share them after the event. Um, and there are many benefits of kind of taking part in this collaborative type funding um, like cluster two. And just yeah, I've just summarized some of the um, main benefits is really yeah, being able to take part to solve um, grand challenges on a kind of global scale. Um, build partnerships um, internationally and also domestically as well. Um, increase visibility, access resources, um, influence international um, standards, regulations and research policies, um, access at a quite high funding rate, um, and also to benefit from a guaranteed and predictable um, source of funding. Um, so I think me and Jamie alluded to the fact that um, you know topics, core topics will be coming up um, in these kind of broad themes. Uh, for the next um, few, few years, which is nice. And also UK has historically been successful in EU funding, which I think is a nice place to start from um, if you're looking to take part. Just some of the basics. Um, anyone can participate in your project um, unless there are any specific restrictions um, for your core topic that you've identified. Um, and always legal entities in EU member states and associate countries uh, would be automatically eligible for funding um, as well from the European Commission. Um, and also some low and middle income countries, or actually I think most low and middle income countries can be also funded. Um, and as I, said, as I said, this is collaborative um, funding, so you would need a minimum um, of kind of three countries involved in your project. And then on the other side, evaluation, um, calls are evaluated on excellence, impact and implementation. And the voting and some of the other details uh, can depend um, slightly on the type of action um, you are applying to. And for the kind of core topics that we're covering today, um, we can focus on research and innovation actions and um, coordination and support actions. Um, so uh, research and innovation actions involve research, um, so they're kind of pure research projects in that sense. Um, and coordination and support actions, on the other hand, um, are more of a coordinatory nature, um, so that they wouldn't kind of really fund pure research in that way normally. And also the online manual that I've linked um, at the bottom is quite useful to kind of walk, walk you through the whole process. In terms of the applica applications that are online, um, you can see a photo on screen of what the funding and tenders portal um, looks like. Um, this website contains the open calls, but also a lot of other useful information and kind of on how to participate um, on support. And also you can also register as, a, as an expert. So you could actually evaluate proposals um, to get some experience of you know how how that looks like um, yeah from that evaluate perspective um, and there's two parts to an, um, um, a submission part a um, it's kind of information that's um, uh, that, that that's entered online in the system just including kind of basic information and part b is the narrative part um, and just to let you know that you know you can kind of see from the page um, numbers in the applications uh, the submissions and then also the actual managing of the grants is quite admin heavy um, and there's normally kind of a significant amount of uh, scientific resource as well um, that's needed um, and you'll also soon see that there is only kind of a small number of, of projects um, usually funded across Europe um, so success rates can be quite low um, if there is a lot of applications as well um, really not to discourage anyone from applying but just I guess encouraging you to kind of put in the time and effort really to write um, and prepare your application as best you can. Um, the chance of getting funding is always quite low, um, so it's really important that, to make sure that you're tackling the right call um, from, the, from the beginning. And I guess really also to highlight to really use the support that's available to you, um, so I'll, I'll cover some of that um, at the beginning um, as well. And now I'll actually hand over to my colleague Jamie to cover the um, actual opportunities that are, um, that are open this year and just some of the detail about them. Brilliant. Thank you, Annie. Um, so, yeah, cluster, cluster 2, there's a focus on uh, culture and creative industries and, and the set of, of calls that are open um, all draw upon or all focused around a set of challenges. So for cultural heritage, it's recognised that there are challenges in, light, in, in regards to climate change, pollution, natural challenges and man-made disasters. They've also recognised the need for better access to cultural resources um, through high quality digitization and better creation of digital assets. In terms of the cultural and creative industries, they, they've recognised that there's a better need to increase their international competitiveness 
Um, and there's also a, a recognition of the, of the value and the need for better understanding of cultural heritage in relation to its uh, shared cultural value and, and sense of belonging. So these are the set of challenges that these, that these calls aim to uh, address. Um, and then there's also a set of um, expected impacts that, that, that is drawn from this then. So it's expected that as a result of these calls, um, the, the cultural heritage, arts, cult, uh, cultural and creative sectors uh, will reach their full potential as a driver of sustainable innovation and as a European sense of belonging um, through continuous engagement with society, citizens and economic sectors, as well as the better protection, restoration and promotion of cultural heritage. Next slide, Annie. So there's, there's a, a series of calls that are open uh, as of um, end of January until uh, April the 20th. And I'll just go through the set of, of, of these calls now so you can see the diversity in them. I think um, for those of you who attended the last um, webinar um, last year, you'll, you'll, you'll recognize the, the, the similar format to these. But the difference this time is there's a much more broader range of disciplinary uh, breadth, which I think is fantastic for the arts, arts and cultural uh, creative sector. So uh, we've got a call that's open um, looking at safeguarding endangered languages. Um, it's expected that they'll be able to fund one project between two to three million euros. Um, the aim of this call will result in a uh, website which will act as a European language preservation ecosystem and will bring, to bring together best practice resources and tools and, and be, be able to uh, open access for a wide range of communities and stakeholders across Europe. Um, crucially, citizen engagement and stakeholder um, design and co-creation is a key part of this, of this particular call. The next call um, expects to fund three projects between two to three million pound, a million euros, sorry, uh, and has a focus on uh, heritage and the arts and promoting the values at home and abroad. Um, this call is, it recognizes the diversity of European arts and cultural heritage and their role in society and is aimed at, at, at utilizing the value, cultural and social value of um, heritage and the arts in, in order to promote Europe's culture and values and interests. And again, this all leads back to promoting uh, or developing an increased international competitiveness. And at the heart of proposals, they expect to see co cooperation with cultural and creative stakeholders. The next call is focused on uh, values and beliefs and, and, and their role in shaping European societies and politics in the 21st century. Here again, they're expected to fund three projects between two to three million euros. Um, this call uh, recognizes the impact of COVID um, on, on, on uh, traditions, values and beliefs and um, seeks to have a better understand perceptions around uh, the society's response and preparedness during a time of crisis and also politics in relation to the EU and have a better understanding of the underlying factors um, impacted, uh, also how perceptions are, uh, have un are part of the underlying factors around European integration process. So the focus here is clearly around uh, European society and what, what values, traditions and values so values, beliefs and traditions make up European societies, politics. The fourth call, again, expects to fund three, two to th uh, three million euro projects. And the focus here is on traditional crafts. Um, again, this is really exciting for us that there's an opportunity to uh, invest in projects we can get traditional crafts. And again, this is new this year, like with the endangered languages uh, call. Um, this particular uh, call um, looks at the reproduction of traditional artifacts, in particular, how cutting edge technologies can, uh, can sort of safeguard uh, traditional uh, uh, craft making um, and thinks about and encourages uh, the sector to think about uh, new areas of application and markets and again expects to see the participation of, of uh, small and medium sized enterprises as well as a variety of stakeholders from, from the European culture and creative industry landscape. The fifth call uh, focuses on the European music ecosystem and really uh, seeks to better understand the economic and social impact of the music sector across Europe. Interestingly, I like with the, 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 the values call, um, it seeks to in, in have a better understanding of the impact of COVID um, on the music sector um, and also um, seeks to better understand the economic impact of social media and homemade music creation as well and, and, and the social and, and cultural role of music. So how do people engage with music? Again, the aim here is to improve the competitiveness of the music ecosystem across Europe. Next call. 
So call number six, again, all these calls are currently open at the moment and, and, and closing in, in April. Similar to the music call, this time focused on the, on the European filmmaking industry. So again, three, three projects between three to four million euros is expected to be funded. It seeks to have a better understanding of the state of art of the European filmmaking industry, looking at a comparative assessment of the international competitiveness of that market and also to identify and pilot new business models potentially and create policy scenarios and tools for economic recovery. Call number seven looks at uh, cultural heritage and the anthrop uh, anthropomorphic threats it faces. Again, funding up to three, three projects, three to four million euros. The focus here is on uh, what new forms of preventative action there could be to um, identify cultural objects and also provenance research, so how they could potentially track objects through new, new, new technologies. Um, and like with some of the other calls, there is a key focus on interdisciplinary and international cooperation here, and, and expects projects to include a wide range of cultural and creative stakeholders. Call number um, eight is one I'm really uh, quite interested in. I hope, hope you all are as well, building on the COP26 momentum. So this looks at cultural heritage and um, climate change. And I think wants you to think about uh, sort of how these hazards could be addressed and what forms of remedi remediation they could be. So it asks for projects to consider innovative and sustainable ways to protect cultural heritage and cultural landscapes. Um, and expects projects to include active involvement of citizens and cooperation with cultural and creative industries. Um, I'm sure many of the individuals and organizations on the call today have um, projects in mind or, or, or experience and skills with, with regards to this. And there's been a lot of interest with regards to the role that the cultural sector can play with regards to um, addressing climate change and working together to, to uh, mitigate and seek remediation in this area. Um, the next call, sorry, I can't see the title of that one sorry um is, is focused games. yeah games and culture shaping games us. perfect yeah so games and culture so again this is this is similar to the um filmmaking and music call where it's seeking to better understand the economic um value and competitiveness but also in addition it's seeking to better understand the cultural role of gaming um uh, for with, with within european culture um so again it expects to see this thing uh, relevant stakeholders included here. So you'd expect to see the gaming sector and designers included here. Um, and, and it hopes to result in a series of policy making um, tools that will improve um, and support and recognize the value of games in society. And the, the final call that's currently open is one that links to the European Bauhaus, which is sort of a, a wider um, policy agenda and, and program within the European Commission. But this particular call expects to fund three, sorry, two, three million euro pro, uh, size projects and hopes to result in innovative architectural and design solutions for the Green Deal with a focus on heritage sites and, and cultural landscapes and expects to see culture and creative industry organizations uh, involved in, in, in designing and, and driving innovation when it comes to addressing the, the Green Deal. Uh, again, th this particular call is part of the wider European Commission Green Deal agenda and also European Bauhaus agenda. And for this one in particular, we expect to see um, architecture, design and arts organisations come to the fore here, working with cultural and creative sector organisations to, to identify and uh, address the social impact and practical solutions that potentially feasibility studies that will support the European Bauhaus movement. Thanks, Jamie. Um, and, you know, I, I will just finish up with a few slides and hopefully we'll have um, time for maybe one or two questions um, at the end. But just, yeah, this slide really highlights some of the other opportunities that are outside of Cluster 2. Um, if you remember the Horizon Europe structure, there's obviously other areas um, um, within it. And also there are these new um, initiatives called missions, uh, which also have some opportunities um, for us and um, humanities um, colleagues. So this may, might be a slide that you maybe refer back to when we share them afterwards. But yeah, just to highlight some of the you know other opportunities that may be of interest as well. And I guess similarly on the um, European Institute of Innovation and Technology, um, they have a new um, knowledge and innovation community that focuses on the cultural and creative sectors and industries. Um, there is a call for proposals open um, until next month, but um, this uh, KIC or Knowledge and Innovation Community will also organise a lot of different um, kind of innovation support activities in the future. So that could be entrepreneurial education, funding of innovation projects, um, business creation, acceler acceleration services and others. 
So I think, you know, this new uh, kick will be designated in the summer. So hopefully, you know, um, I guess it's a good thing to keep an eye on, you know, in the future as well for, uh, for different opportunities. And really this is to wrap up, um, there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of sources of information for you as well. Um, and yeah, kind of brokerage tools and, you know, other um, things to support you to access the funding. But I think, you know, just a final point that I think that I really want you to take away from this presentation is that um, there is support to you if you want to apply. Um, so obviously you can reach out to me as a national contact point. There's also, you know, international and, you know, different national networks of national contact points that you can get in touch with um, through the links. So I think that's, you know, just, I guess, yeah, what I wanted you to guess, take, really take away from this is if you are interested, do get in touch with us, um, you know, even after this event. And, you know, we can um, definitely schedule um, meetings and, you know, just um, support you in your applications. But I think we've got three minutes. So if there's maybe one or two um, kind of questions that might be good to address at this point, um, I'd be happy to do that. I'm, I'm sure Jamie would be too. Thanks, Annie. Um, we've had a couple come through. Um, the first one that's that's come through is a bit of concern about the, the UK's association to Horizon. Um, so the person who's asked, asked this question stated that they know that there are mitigations in place, but the experience of Swiss award holders underscores the practical risks that are involved. Um, can you speak at all to how big the risk is for this going forward? Um, I think definitely, and I do understand that, and I do obviously hear you know feedback from other countries and you know um, and UK applicants who are trying to um, 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 apply for funding opportunities. And I guess um, I guess my take on it is um, I'm quite confident for these cluster two calls um, because in terms of you know in terms of the highlight timeline of when um, the UK association would have to be finalised, um, that's at the point of the grant agreement signature. So that's at the point of um, kind of after you've actually received your um, funding result and whether you've been successful or not, so that would be towards the end of the year, um, where you would have to be signing an agreement with the Commission, um, and at that point the UK would have to be associated. So I think in my perspective, um, it's obviously hard to say, but I do think that we would have a, a result um, to this, you know, um, before the end of the year. Um, so I personally don't see a lot of risk, but obviously I do understand that it's, you know, it is, it is an ideal situation. So if you do I guess maybe I can offer that if you do want to kind of chat, you can always yeah email me and I think um, my email was shared um, in the chat as well. So, you know, please get in touch. Um, I'm happy to chat or happy to send resources or, you know, um, help you, I guess, in, in that way in um, collaborating with um, European colleagues, which I, which I do understand it is a challenge. But yeah, I guess I just want to say from my perspective, you know, I'm quite hopeful um, that cluster two shouldn't be affected too much uh, because we do still have until the end of the year, really, for this situation to be resolved. Um, so there's still some time, um, which, which is good. Great, thank you. Um, just one further question as well. Is there a way that applicants can know or network with the attendees who might be planning projects or applying for some of these themes? I think that's that's a good question. And I guess I guess my you know advice would maybe be using the chats, for example, today. I think that that's a good resource to kind of offer what you can do um, hear about hear, hear about other people what they're doing so I would definitely encourage people to just yeah a brief confusion this is of themselves send that in the chat and you know see if there's um I guess people that you could connect with um, but also on the slides as well there is some um uh, so that the slides that I will share afterwards there is some um links for example to a brokerage tool um that you can access and you know there's profiles from across Europe as well um on there so I guess that's um you know, there's a lot of, and again, maybe get in touch with me as well. Um, I do, that seems a bit of a cop-out, but I think, you know, I, I would like to, you know, offer the opportunity to really kind of personal, um, you know, I guess chatting about personal circumstances and, you know, context, um, kind of specific situations as well. So do feel free to get in touch with me if you want um, kind of tailored advice um, as well about how to, how to reach partners across Europe. I think we're at time now. So did we exactly. want to move into the first case studies? Thank you. Yes, I think um, we had um, Nick um, from the last theory, um, first of all. Yeah, sorry, um, my screen is looking a bit funny, but yeah, I think we're good. So yeah, Nick, if you wanted to um, um, start um, just yeah, um, with your presentation, I'm very interested to hear it. Great. Uh, I will just, let me just find the... Um, Presentation. Here we go. Hi, can everyone see that? Um, I think we're seeing some um, things in the background as well. Okay. Oh, 
Try again. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. Thanks. Perfect. You. All right. Um, so my name is Nick Tandavanich, and I'm one of the artists uh, in a group called Blast Theory, and we're an artist-led group based in Brighton in the UK. Um, and we have a long history of making interactive art, often in collaboration with higher education, uh, in particular with um, an HCI lab based at the University of Nottingham called the Mixed Reality Lab. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today about a project we made with them called GIFT. Um, and this was a, a digital visitor experience that we developed um, for museums as a, as a kind of a lightweight way for small museums in particular to create sort of a digitally led engagement that extends the reach of their collections. So as I say, uh, GIFT was a project we uh, developed with the University of Nottingham, but it, it was also a part of a, a wider research project, also confusingly named GIFT, um, that was funded by Horizon 2020. And that project ran for three years up to the end of 2019. And it brought together a, a kind of variety of different organisations from across Europe. So it included Culture24, based here in the UK, as I say, Nottingham University, also a Serbian digital agency called Next Game, uh, university, Uppsala University in Sweden, uh, IT University in Copenhagen, and Europeania, uh, Europeana in the Netherlands, which is a kind of, a sort of cultural heritage sector organisation. Um, and the ambi ambition of the project was really to sort of try and, well, it was kind of twofold, was to, to find a way to create some experiments uh, that were sort of digital visitor experiences that would uh, test, um, test different approaches to sort of working with digital in museums. And through those experiments, kind of share knowledge across the sector and across the organisations that were involved in the project but also to, to actually build some practical tools and experiences that would be reused and would be taken forwards as, as, as kind of outcomes for, for the work. Um, so when we began, uh, we, one of the kind of part of the kind of design brief for us was really sort of learning that sort of museums often have very sort of limited capacity to make digital offers. And so that become part of the sort of, uh, the kind of constraints for how we, how we worked. Also realizing that um, uh, visitors are all, to museums are already sharing content, but it's often in very sort of superficial ways, that, you know, it's like speaking selfies or the kind of focus or the relationship with collections is, is, is hard to kind of, uh, um, is not necessarily the focus of, of the way that people share in museums. Uh, the other was learning from museums that often the problem isn't that they lack content, Museums have huge collections of items that are full of interesting histories and full of stories. Uh, what's the problem that they often face is they have too much content and they're, they're trying to find ways for, to give uh, visitors focus. Um, so what we came up with uh, was um, a project called GIFT. Uh, so GIFT is um, a, a web app that you um, can open on your smartphone and it's for creating a digital gift for someone that you love. So uh, you're prompted by a, a narrator who kind of guides you to explore the museum. Um, um, and they then invite you to choose uh, up to three objects from the museum. And each, each, each um, choice is made with a specific prompt from the narrator. Um, once you've chosen your objects, you can then record a message uh, for the person that you've chosen to give that object to. And then this, the, the web app then wraps it all up uh, and sends it off um, via a share link to that person. So it's a very, very kind of simple um, experience. The way that you, you um, the entry point into the, the work is that when you come to the, um, the ticket desk at the museum, you're actually given a gift from the museum itself. One of the things we wanted to do was trying to sidestep the kind of didactic or kind of more formal approaches of museum guides make this something where it felt very personal so the gift that you receive from the museum is on a postcard you peel a little sticker you find a qr code and then when you open the gift it's actually voiced by a member of staff and not necessarily a curator or someone who is um, high up in the museum it's often someone who's an enthusiast and an invigilator someone who just has a passion for some part of the collection and they have chosen three things that they wanted to share with you 
having explored the museum and found those three objects, you're then invited to make a gift of your own for someone that you love. And you can choose from anything in the museum. And as I say, there's a narrator who prompts you to go exploring around the museum. So one of the unique things about the project, uh, and I'll talk a bit more about how it developed over the three years, was, was really having the opportunity to work closely with the museum over the course of those three years. And one of the people who was key in, in our uh, sort of development of the project was uh, the digital manager at Brighton Museum here in Brighton, someone called Kevin Bacon. And his experience and knowledge of how visitors use the museum, his understanding of how the collection was uh, um, sort of viewed by the public or the things that people held enthusiasms for. Also the kind of knowledge about the constraints of the museum as an organization and what its capacities were, were all completely sort of embedded into us understanding how we were gonna deliver something that was actually useful and usable for them. Um, and our goal was really to try and make something which was uh, brought together the, the, I suppose, our different expertises. And as an artist group, our, our our expertise isn't particularly in making museum-led experiences. Our expertise is in creating experiences which feel compelling or personal or passionate or exciting, but not necessarily, we didn't necessarily bring knowledge around the museums. And one of the things that happened in the course of this project was really a kind of sharing of perspectives. And so, yeah, as I say, it was a partnership which uh, took place over three years. Um, and in that time we had three uh, major trials, uh, which were aside from doing small scale tests. So we had three large scale public trials that actually let us evolve and, and develop this kind of project with um, a proper set of data and feedback that we were working with from working with HCI researchers based at the University of Nottingham. because so they kind of gave us a, real, a really strong grounding and something that was really unique for us. It, space to reflect, a space to develop, a space to kind of make decisions based on data and work with researchers as opposed to our, our, our own hunches and that's, that's, that was a real kind of pleasure. The outputs of the project are, are multiple, uh, like the R1 experiment um, um, had uh, I think two papers published in CHI as part of the outputs um, for it. And also we, the internally and externally, we've shared sort of reports about how, how the project worked and how the different experiments worked. And those are available through a public website. Then GIFT, the, the web app, uh, we also published as an open source platform. And it's been adopted by um, a couple of museums. Uh, uh, the Monk Museum in Oslo, which was one of the partners, adopted it for uh, one of their closing exhibitions uh, before they moved building. And I think Karlsruhe, the Stats Museum in Karlsruhe has now um, forked the open source project and they are kind of redeveloping the whole, the whole platform as a way of virtualizing their gift shop, which is, uh, was a, a sort of interesting concept for us. So it's good to see it still moving. Uh, and I think our next step is we're in the middle of translating gift into Mandarin at the moment uh, with a, an eye towards working with museums based in China. Um, if you'd like to know more about the project, um, Gift is, uh, is online at gifting.digital. It's a very kind of weird URL, but there you go. Um, uh, and the project it show, talks about not just our experiment, but some of the, the, the other experiments that were done by other partners and some of the tools that are available for people working in the museum sector. Thank you very much, Nick. I think that was, you know, great to kind of see how you know how these projects that we I guess advertise the opportunities for how this actually look in real life and what what they actually can um, create I guess um, during the project life so I think that was great and just want to remind you that you can post um, questions to Nick or you know generally to um, to our speakers um, in the Q and A um, section but also um, you know I guess if you want to yeah, um, contact them um, later and I'm sure they'd be happy to you know um, explain further about you know what what's um, yeah how, how their projects worked. Um, I think we have um, our next um, speaker from Art Films. So uh, let me shortly introduce myself and uh, then um, with half of Annie uh, we show a, a short video about the project and then I talk a little bit about uh, Art Films and uh, how we got involved to the project and uh, how a short uh, or a small company faces uh, a kind of uh, this kind of project, big project. So 
Um, would you please uh, uh, show the video? Thank you. In a world where visual and textual data are in abundance, creative industries want to reuse and repurpose them so as to innovate and remain competitive. Let's talk a little bit about the company. So actually, uh, Art Films was uh, established in 2000 based uh, in Melbourne, Australia. And uh, Alfim, LTD, the daughter company of, uh, of uh, Art Film Melbourne, was incorporated in 2011. So the, the founder and the director of the company always said that Art Film was born of passion uh, for the beauty and complexity of arts. Our aspiration was to create a curriculum without border by introducing artists, uh, visionaries who were inspired by the world through uh, decades and centuries. Uh, the art film collection was always for the open-minded and uh, for the curious city as it was directed to our slogan, art film, educated imagination. So actually, Art Films is a, a very small company um, and uh, with a big, uh, big uh, history behind. And, um, and uh, it is also a distributor and a producer, a film producer company uh, specialized for arts education. And uh, it has a very large international collection and uh, a wide work of contemporary artists, uh, art history, uh, uh, films with uh, significant local impact uh, funded homes and uh, the academic libraries uh, all over in, in the world. So actually, um, the reason why uh, art films was involved uh, in this V4 design project was that um, that it has a really large variety of coll film collections and uh, it means that uh, more than 2000 films uh, uh, could be involved to these projects and uh, and uh, this this was a, a very big collection uh, that could be used to these uh, projects. Actually, uh, about, uh, so as we couldn't see the, the video, uh, I saw some, some basic things about this V4 design uh, project. It was a, a virtual a textural content repurposing uh, a project for architectural design and uh, video virtual related games. The project started in um, uh, January of 2018 and ended last year, uh, officially in March, but uh, facing with a lot of administration and uh, with, uh, with this pandemic situation, uh, it's ended uh, uh, second part of 2011. Um, so the project, uh, uh, this V4 design project uh, was to reuse and repropose uh, uh, multimedia content uh, by uh, uh, proposing an innovative uh, solution for its effective integration, extract to 3D uh, representation and v VR game environments. So um, the project, uh, the main idea behind uh, V4 Design was to reuse the uh, visual uh, content. I mean, movies, uh, documentaries, paintings, images, artworks, uh, photos about artworks, and also textual content from text documentation, streams, critics, catalogs, etc. Et and uh, V4 Design developed a, a big data collection, and uh, this tool uh, can be used uh, for uh, these uh, 3D and VR uh, representations from objects and buildings and uh, city uh, landscapes. And uh, this uh, big database can be used uh, for architects, designers, and uh, video game uh, creators. So um, 
for um, for creative industry, uh, it can be uh, imagined that these big contents. Uh, one of the content product providers was Art Films. Um, could uh, could be reused, reprovised, and and also uh, took in really small pieces and made a very big uh, data database that can be provided for the creative industry. Um, would you please go back one slide, Annie? Thank you. So uh, about the the members of the of the uh, uh, projects. There were 11 um, uh, um, partners from eight countries, um, from cultural sector, technical researchers, and also uh, universities. So actually, as a, Artium, as a small company, um, beside uh, the pandemic situation, also faced uh, um, some problems for example, the Brexit program uh, problem from UK, and also uh, there was uh, so uh, uh, we faced that uh, with a very small uh, uh, team. Um, it was uh, really challenging to join um, such a big project. However, we really enjoyed it, and uh, and uh, it was really. Uh, a good experience, so I can uh, advise anybody who uh, who is interested to join such kind of uh, creative program and and uh, take part of it um, and and um, and enjoy the possibilities, the knowledge, uh, uh, the new technologies, uh, the meeting the partners, uh, the new experiences uh, that they can face with during uh, such kind of project. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm really open to answer them. And also you can uh, follow uh, uh, the details uh, about the project uh, on, on, uh, on, uh, on YouTube, also on, on the project website, on Facebook, Twitter, etc. Thank you so much, Kathleen. I think that was, again, a great presentation of... Um, mm -hmm. I guess a small company's perspective of taking part in these projects and um, what 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 can be done. I guess in the context of um, large scale projects like these. Um, and I do have a lot of about the video not working, so I will I will show uh, it's, it's available on YouTube. So you yes, can. exactly. I can I can send the link um, in the chat, yeah. and I think we are actually scheduled for a break um, now. So you know I, I'll share the um, uh, video link in the chat. So if you um, if everyone wants to check that's during the um, uh, break, then yeah, um, you are free to do so. It's really interesting to see. I guess our first two presenters were, were more from the kind of creative industry side. So I think now we're moving um, towards the, um, I guess, cultural heritage museum um, side of things. So um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see um, from your perspective as well, how it's been to um, take part in these projects. I think we're now seeing the, uh, I can't remember what the view is called, but it's the one where you can see both sides. Oh, the presenter's view, okay. Yeah. Okay. <sighs> There's display settings um, at the very top, and I think there's an option to switch like which screen shows okay. which. Switch them, then we should see the. Um, yeah. Is that it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Hello, Thank everyone. Um, my name is Pip Lawrence, and I'm the head of collection care research at Tate. I'm Bronwyn Nomsby. I'm principal conservation scientist at Tate. Thank you for inviting us. We're delighted to be here. So uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about collection care research, um, which addresses our research priorities linked to the care and management of our collections. And European funding has contributed significantly to helping us to build our research in this area. And we've been awarded funding through four different European research funding streams. And we share our experience of European funding very much from an independent research organization perspective, and of course, a museum perspective. Uh, we've been involved in many different projects, and um, we're going to gallop quickly through a sample of these just to give you a sense of the research we've been involved in, funded by Europe. And before we move on to just sharing some of the challenges and benefits and our top tips uh, that we've been asked to share with you uh, for this event. So the first um, 
Creative Europe funded the first major European research project that we were involved in, namely Inside Installations, the preservation and presentation, uh, presentation of installation art from between 2004 and 2007. This was um, led by the Netherlands Institute for Cultural Heritage and the project involved a wide array of cultural heritage partners from across Europe. The project not only made a major contribution to theory and practice in contemporary art conservation through its case studies and research strands, but also built a network which is still really strong today and has led to a number of follow-on projects, all of which have helped to define the field. I also wanted to uh, mention Presto for you as this was a coordinating action which is quite similar to the UKRI networking grants. For us it was really helpful in raising our profile as a sector leader kind of working in the conservation of time-based media and other digital um, art forms and it helped to um, helped us to work with a number of partners on developing our digital infrastructure and also kind of got the word out to peer reviewers, I think, that we were doing work in this area. Presto for You was instrumental in our joining our first framework program grant. This was called Pericles and it operated from between 2013 and 2017. Um, and this was again focused on digital preservation. Through our work with Presto for You, we were invited to join as the lead for the use case on arts and media. The other use case was space data. So we also got to watch astronauts doing experiments on the European Space Space Station from uh, the Operation Centre of Belgium, which was fascinating. So Pericles made it possible for us to work with major research ag agencies such as Xerox and a number of important universities to develop ontologies for the preservation of software-based art and develop both theory and practice for the preservation of our digital collections. We've also been involved in some more heavily scientific projects and one example of that is Nano Restart, which ran from 2015 onwards for 42 months, which was funded through the Horizon 2020 program. This was led by Professor Piero Baglioni of the Centre for Colloid and Surface Science at the University of Florence in Italy. This project was very large. It had 27 partners bringing together academics, industry, heritage institutions and private conservators to explore various nanotechnologies for their application to challenges around the preservation of contemporary art, including such aspects as cleaning, the stabilization of canvas and painting structures, the removal of unwanted materials such as coatings and the enhanced protection of works of art on display and in storage. This timely rigorous research has result, resulted in new tools that have been rigorously evaluated within museum and private practice settings and have much wider applicability. We've also been involved in one Mary Skwadowska Curie Innovative Training Network, which funded 15 doctoral positions under the theme New Approaches to the Conservation of Contemporary Art. This training network has been game changing for the emerging field of contemporary art conservation. Um, it was great for us because it funded training and supervision um, as well as all the, the student costs. We're now really feeling the impact of this ITN as the doctoral students are now taking up positions in institutions all over the world and represent the next generation of leaders in the field of contemporary art conservation. Moving on to another largely scientific based project, this is the cleaning of modern oil paints, which was funded through a joint programming initiative from 2015 for three years and led by Professor Klaas-Jan van der Berg of the University of Amsterdam and Cultural Heritage Agency of the Netherlands. There are a group of key partners based on existing long standing research relationships, which were sustained over many years and an, an additional five associate partners. Through this three-year project, you can see on the slide, we explored uh, oil paints in many, many ways, including looking at uh, paint formulations, the artist's use of oil paints, the curing processes, chemical and physical properties and responses to aging, which was all then used to inform ways to decrease the sometimes alarming risks associated with the conservation treatment of modern oil painted surfaces and other contemporary oil painted works of art. 
So why is European funding so important? Well, for us, it was really important. It is really important because it treats research partners equally, whether you're a university, a heritage partner, or a small or medium enterprise, and it really supports interdisciplinary research. European grants in most cases cover the full costs of research, making it possible for us to contribute to groundbreaking initiatives. European funding supports research that's practice-based and applied, as well as pure research. This matters to us as it's essential that we translate our research and new knowledge into changes in the way in which we care for our collections. The partnerships that have been developed through these European projects are career defining and have spanned a number of years and a number of projects. Of course, impacts are wide and varied, both immediate and longer term, and projects can cover a lot of ground over a relatively short period. Many produce sector-wide training within project timelines, offering serious training for future generations of heritage and other professionals. Academic peer-reviewed papers are also a key output, which are timely and useful for reporting requirements such as REF, and particularly when open access requirements are fulfilled and other engagement routes are also engaged. These projects provide opportunities for people who have not worked in the GLAM sector at all and uh, to work with us, which can be in fact career defining and help develop and sustain specialisms which will put us in a better position to address future challenges. Both humanities and science-led project partners continue to work together and regularly submit funding, bids to follow on and complementary funding schemes. The research can really help accelerate change in the field, bringing momentum and forging reflection, new methodologies, tools and change. These projects have provided access to expertise and resources that lie outside the museum and offer opportunities to be involved in these cutting edge projects. The learning this brings to our sector has really been considerable. The funding also enables stronger European connections and knowledge exchange and builds a community. But uh, there are also some challenges. So Tate doesn't have a large grants office that you might expect to find, for example, at a university. So a research project manager funded through the grant is essential. Pace can be fast with these projects with well-defined deliverables, timescales and high levels of accountability. For us, the exchange rate issues are hard to manage and can be significant over a three, four or five year project. So it's really important to hold a contingency to cover any shortfall created by these fluctuations. Well, um, while this is great for expanding networks, it's beneficial to have a core group. Um, oh, this is you. Sorry, Roman. <laughs> No, you were doing a fine job. Um, okay, I was just uh, continuing on from there. Um, essentially, um, some partners that you work with in projects may not have worked with your sector before, so it's important to understand uh, each other's uh, expectations around that. Um, one of the things that uh, we discuss quite frequently in the museum sector is the term end user how, and how that is not really appropriate to the way we are doing research and participating in research. Um, so understanding our expertise and the specialisms as researchers is often a bit of a learning curve in these projects partnerships, uh, but we always get there in the end. And uh, one of the other challenges, of course, and it's not limited to European funding by any means, is finding follow-on funding for some of these uh, fantastic ideas. So we find ourselves sometimes unable to capitalise on the training of, of the new people who've come through these projects, and we can, in fact, lose uh, some new, very exciting talent. So just finally to wrap up our top tips, of course, make sure it really matters to you and your organization and that it's an institutional priority and keep the project relevant and present throughout. Because of the level of commitment these projects require in terms of staff time and infrastructure, we'd say don't join a project where your grant is less than 500,000 um, because you really need that infrastructure and that kind of impact in order to make it worthwhile. Um, really coordinating a re uh, EU research project is a really heavy lift, but leading a work package is really rewarding and we find that you get back what you put in. Build sustainable and strategic consortia around areas of research interest, which will sustain you through different 
grant calls with events and meetings held outside of grant delivery periods to help maintain relationships and refine strategies. An example of this for us was the Modern Oils Research Consortium, which Tate instigated and coordinates. Thank you very much for listening. We're very happy to take questions later. Um, thank you very much, Bronwyn and Pip um, from Tate. I think that was, again, a really good overview of all the different types or kind of, yeah, I guess an example really of, you can just, you know, take part in so many different things. And obviously, you know, I guess there's different <laughs> infrastructures in different organizations, but, you know, it is a, it is in inspiration, I guess, um, um, I'm sure for many of us. Um, and I think, Gra Graham, you're next. Um, I'm happy to share your slide. I think you only had one. Um, so maybe that, that would be a good option. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, if I can just uh, introduce myself first and then I'll ask you to show the slide. What an interesting note to finish on, Pip. Nothing under 500,000. Um, because uh, the reason I only have one slide today is that rather than talk in detail about some of the projects I've been involved with, and uh, one in particular, which was a Horizon one, I just thought, why are you all here? What are you looking for? Because probably you hear that you're thinking, hmm, is this for me? Is this an adventure that I haven't yet had? And so I decided that I would just do the one slide. So rather than going into one project in detail, I wanted to kind of give you a sense of what, what a map of Europe might look like to you in terms of opportunity. So not geography, but in terms of where might today lead? And I have to say, in terms of my experience, quite a number have been under the 500,000. But I would also say that um, we have never had the ambition to be a lead partner, which I think um, requires not only a certain capacity and acumen, um, but it's something that you really need to be cut out for. And that's something that I've gladly offered to other people to do. Um, so, Annie, if you can share my screen for me, thank you. Now, I, I, don't, I don't plan to read through this, but I, I, I described it as being a map of Europe. Um, in terms of my experience of what Europe has to offer, in terms of the people, the funding and the projects, and there are eight projects here which uh, really cover about 10 years worth of activity in European partnerships and programs. Um, Cultura is a small uh, NGO charity in the UK um, and in some ways we're probably much more active across Europe than many other cultural heritage uh, charities in the UK um, because we want to be so the first thing is, how much do you really want to be searching out and being ambitious and developing new partnerships and perhaps um, going that little bit beyond your comfort zone, but on a subject that you're really passionate about? And for me, those sort of passionate subjects are all around cultural heritage, which is where Cultura began over 50 years ago. Um, but a number of these projects have developed through relationships and relationships really are at the heart of this because relationships are about where you not only learn but derive some sort of value from that learning uh, in a sense a legacy which is why I do have a column at the end of this because it's very easy to think about these projects as being fixed term um, you uh, get into discussion with people, you explore what a project might be, um, you commit to it, you run for three, four years perhaps at the most, um, and then that's it and you, you've moved on. But very often those relationships become something that you build on for future opportunities. And um, picking up on some of the presentations during today, um, most of the projects I've been involved with have between six and about 13, 15 partners. And that can be quite a task to manage in terms of those relationships, but it is very rewarding. And some of those projects have come about through Cultura, being a UK partner and having the particular profile. In other words, the market out there for partners knows that we're here saying, hello, we'd like to be 
involved and we have particular interests that might complement others. Um, one of the other routes is uh, through European networks. So it's not only the visibility, but it's the way in which we uh, become connected to organizations having similar interests. Um, Europeana has been mentioned a few times, but my particular involvement, I, I have a number, but the biggest one is Europa Nostra, which has also been mentioned in the chat. And Europa Nostra is one of those bigger, um, in a sense, cosmopolitan organizations where within cultural heritage, all of the different themes um, somehow come together. And one of my biggest bugbears um, in the UK, as well as across Europe, is the compartmentation, particularly uh, dividing tangible heritage from intangible heritage. And so a number of the projects I've become involved with um, have been a, a conscious act to try to bring different communities together. And that might be, for example, digital and cultural heritage. And some of these projects do that. Or it might be in terms of um, tourism uh, or economic development or the real concern across Europe at the decline of traditional skills. So it's finding what is it that you, you would like to do that somehow progresses what you're already doing in a way that is interesting and will um, uh, develop your your own organization's interests, um, but also personally would be um, satisfying. Um, and Jamie mentioned in his introduction, I mean, there are, there are 10 themes, 10 streams that you could look at. So the, the answer really is whatever you're interested in, there will be something within European funding programs and particularly within Horizon Europe um, that will meet your need. So that then comes onto the point, yeah, but how do I get into it? Where are the gateways? And one of the points that someone made in the chat was, well, what if you have never really registered, participated, and you don't have um, a pick? Well, the European Commission does allow subcontracting. It's, it's not a great way in terms of putting a heavy reliance on it, but there are some opportunities where organizations that are new to European activity can get a taste of what things are about without taking on the significant um, responsibilities that a full partner or indeed a, a coordinating part partner would do. And that's quite an important uh, consideration. Um, the other thing is that um, last year, uh, post-Brexit, um, there was a lot of misinformation, um, quite a common word these days, um, but there was a lot of misinformation about whether UK organisations could fully participate um, in European projects. And in fact, um, one French organisation, a university, uh, advised me after about three exploratory meetings that um, Cultura wouldn't be eligible to participate. Um, that was incorrect. So it's about understanding that the people you're talking to really know their way around. And perhaps in terms of partnerships, um, the, the most, those with the most zest um, will be those which have a few partners who are really experienced and know their way around, not just the subject, but the processes of working within a European context but also bringing in some that are new, that are strong in terms of their own credentials, but haven't really worked within the European um, context. So that also is something that is just worth considering. So just looking at these projects uh, as, as a bit of an indicator, um, some of them are specific to traditional skills, which is a theme, as I said, that um, uh, Cultura has really had to work hard at. But you'll also see within this that um, we have to be capable of being flexible and adaptable. And a number of European projects have suffered from the pandemic. How can you, how can you develop relationships if you can't meet? There was one project that I started, Impactur, which is through uh, Europa Nostra, uh, representing them. Uh, we had the startup meeting in January 2020, and that's it. I haven't met them since. 
But the reality is that the uh, ability to meet online and work does happen and we'll be looking forward to meeting again later this year. So the answer really to today's thing is um, go out and see what the world has to offer. There will be something there. There will be someone out there who will welcome you. And whether it's Horizon Europe or whether it's one of the other programmes, um, certainly Horizon Europe, today's subject, uh, offers considerable scope. And I would just like to close really with the point that Cultura has gone from being a very traditional in a way 1960s civic organisation through the process of traditional skills into now the realm of um, sustainable development goals, which has brought us into the uh, new European Bauhaus for which we did do a submission just a few weeks ago. So yet again, it's about being part of that wider agenda. Enjoy it, go out there and be part of it. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. I think that was, a, again, really nice kind of comments on the different ways that people can get involved. And yes, I'm positive, um, I guess, um, um, conclusions as well. And yes, I think I'm, I've seen that um, uh, we've got the next presenter um, preparing. So yes, thank you very much, May. And over to you. I think, yeah, we are now moving on to more of the um, kind of research infrastructure um, presentations. Um, so I hope this will be of, of interest as well. Yeah, and now with me, so I'm unmuting. Uh, hello. I'd like to spend the next few minutes to talk to you about ERIS, the European Research Infrastructure for Heritage Science, and uh, the UK's participation in that research infrastructure. So what are research infrastructures? These are facilities that provide resources and services for research communities to conduct research and foster innovation. They can be used beyond research, for example, for education or public services, and they may be single-sited, distributed or virtual. Okay. I think it's not moving. Um, sometimes what I find I have to do is just click on the screen with my mouse and then use the kind of um, arrows and then it moves, but I don't know if ah, that's- There we go. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. No, don't panic is the, is the answer. Okay. So the particular research infrastructure I would like to talk about is the one for heritage science. And some of you may be familiar with heritage science, some of you might not, so a quick description of what that might involve is here presented. Heritage science is the interdisciplinary domain of scientific study of, of heritage. Heritage science draws on diverse humanities, sciences and engineering disciplines. It focuses on enhancing the understanding, care and sustainable use of heritage so it can enrich people's lives both today and in the future. Heritage science is an umbrella term encompassing all forms of scientific inquiry into human works and the combined works of nature and humans of value to people. ERIS has a number of core activities that support research. I have highlighted in bold the ones which are particularly relevant, so I'm not going to read this list, but access provision um, is really important. The organization and management of access provision to facilities is one of the key uh, reasons for the existence of these research infrastructures. User support is provided as well and engagement with users of those facilities. Training is provided in order to enable those wanting to use facilities to be able to use them competently, confidently and to their full capability. Inter international relationships are at the, at the heart of the way research infrastructures work at a European level. There are digital infrastructures as well and the management and curation of digital data. Fair data and lab structures are at the heart. 
Uh, these are the countries that are currently on the interim General Assembly of the European Research Infrastructure for Heritage Science, and the number is set to grow. There are also associated partners um, that are not included here, but who have observer status and not non-voting rights. So what is the structure of ERIS? There is a central hub with a seat in Florence and will be a unique access point of the research infrastructure. Around it cluster a number of nodes, national nodes, which will organize facilities at a national level. ERIS UK is the national load node for the UK with the coordinator representing the UK on the committee of national nodes. What is the UK context for ERIS? So UKRI has made major national investment in heritage science, which is led by AHRC. Recently, the AHRC Capability for Collections CAPCO fund awarded 15 million pounds and invested them in modernizing the research infrastructure of museums, galleries, libraries, archives, and university laboratories across the UK. There is now an anticipated investment into the Research Institute for Conservation and Heritage Science, in brief known as Riches, of approximately £60 million over a five-year period for setup and implementation, followed by an initial 20 years of operation. So this is a deep and long-term commitment to heritage science support. Riches will use the access model of ERIS, platforms and provision of services um, uh, that are available already and being developed. And we envisage that the UK national load node will eventually be cited within Riches. So ERIS access provision platforms, there are four of these. There's ArcLab, which provides access to heritage archives and collections, Digilab, the database and tools for heritage research, FixLab, accessing laboratories and advanced uh, research facilities, and MoLab, mobile instruments for diagnostics. So access to services will be provided via periodic calls every six months, and the and virtual access to Digilab will be provided continuously. This is ERIS, not ERIS UK. So ERIS UK is still in its embryonic form, but at a European level, these are what the plans are, which are likely to be mirrored by the UK. So here are a couple of examples, a few examples from ERIS UK um, of these different types of platforms. So the National Gallery hosts the Arc Lab, which are the physical archives of data and samples, reports and correspondence, photographs, exhib exhibition records, publications and press records. So these, this is one example. Another example is DigiLab, which is the archaeology data service based at the University of York. A it is an accredited digital repository for heritage data. It supports research, learning and teaching, promotes good practice in the use of data and provides technical support for heritage scientists. Fixed Lab, the example I'm giving here is of Diamond Light Source, which is the National Synchrotron Science Facility. It is probing changes in the surface and structural properties of materials under reactive environments. It has a non-destructive synchrotron techniques are used, which are pivotal to improving our ability to conserve historic artifacts in many conservation projects. The brightness of the synchrotron light facilities allows improved analytical sensitivity for time resolved measurements during exposure of historical artifacts to reactive environments, while also permitting simultaneous multi-technique characterizations. And there are many synchrotron facilities of, uh, across Europe, uh, Europe. And finally, MOLAB, and this is one example of MOLAB 
uh, available in the UK, which is hosted by the UCL Institute for Sustainable Heritage. It is leading in cross-disciplinary research and in innovative teaching for future heritage scientists. It partners with leading public and private sector organization and forms part of the EPSRC Center for Doctoral Training in Science and Engineering in Arts, Heritage and Archaeology. So what is the ERIS roadmap? ERIS is preparing to set up operations, <coughs> excuse me, as an ERIC, a European Research Infrastructure Consortium. As yet, it has currently no legal form. However, step one to go uh, towards, a, towards the setting up of ERIS has been approved. And this year, we expect us to see a step two submission with the UK also participating and paying its membership fee to, um, to ERIS ERIC. And ERIS ERIC, when it is established, will then, um, there will be a, an implementation phase, which is likely to take about five years. So what is the current status of the of ERIS UK node? There are 21 organizations which form part at the moment of the ERIS UK node, including museums, galleries, heritage organizations, research organizations, and universities. It is a partnership of those willing to collaborate in setting up of ERIS UK. This is based on signed MOUs. ERIS UK has no current legal status because ERIS, it, at a European level, has no current legal status yet. A working group is now being convened under the aegis of e e AHRC to ensure proper alignment of ERIS UK as a national node of ERIS. And this is because since step one has a, been approved and step two is in preparation and the UK is about to make a commitment to joining ERIS, and an implementation plan has been submitted to the European Union for approval and funding. Now is the time for the UK to begin to develop its organization and processes to um, mirror those in the UK. So the question is, excuse me, because this is getting, oh, sorry, that was, what are the opportunities for funding through Horizon Europe and how can members engage generally with EU opportunities? As an ERIC, a European Research Infrastructure Consortium, ERIS will be an intergovernmental consortium and thus not an EU organisation and therefore not affected by Brexit. EU research programmes, the framework programmes, always have a budget to support ERICs because there are many ERICs out there already. This budget has increased from Horizon 2020 to Horizon Europe. ERICs can bid for projects from Horizon Europe, either individually or jointly, if they see that there are issues that they have in common and would want to develop them together and address them together. As a national node, the UK would be eligible to participate in future Horizon Europe calls and fully expects to do so. Funding for access, for example, funding for access providers to facilities, will need to happen nationally, that is through Riches, the institute that AHRC is championing its creation. Those wishing to access UK facilities will also be funded nationally, but in their own countries. UK research organisations may choose not to be part of ERIS UK, but that means they cannot offer access through ERIS, which supports more users, more research and more collaboration. Outside ERIS, organisations may engage with research projects that are enabled or organised by ERIS. So it's, ERIS will operate as, as inclusively as possible. 
think that's the end of my presentation. And thank you very much for listening. Um, thank you very much, um, May. Um, and I just want to, you know, remind everyone that we do have some time for some questions at the end. Um, but I think we will now move swiftly on to um, the next um, presenter, Martin. Hello, hello everybody. Um, I'm Martin Wynne from uh, the University of Oxford. Um, Andy, are you going to be able to share my slides for me, please? Um, I think I am sharing them. I hope everyone can see them. Um, okay, I can't see them yet. I can still see the nearest one, but it may be just slow to oh catch no. up. Okay. I can see the Clarence slide, Annie. Okay, um, so I think, yeah, Martin, you can always, I guess, Put okay, your slides fine. up on your own screen, yeah, and we can all see them. Um, so yeah, I'm a senior researcher in corpus linguistics at the University of Oxford. Uh, I'm also the national coordinator for Clarin, which is what I'll be talking to you about today. Um, so thanks, first of all, to May for explaining some of the, uh, the background to um, uh, what ERICs are, European research infrastructures. Clarin is a virtual distributed um, research infrastructure. Um, it's a kind of acronym for the, the Common Language Resources and Technology Infrastructure. Um, it's been an ERIC since 2012. Um, it was, I think, the first one in the sort of humanities and social sciences area. Um, and the goal is to provide easy and sustainable access for scholars in the humanities and social sciences and beyond to digital language data, um, <clears throat> whether that's in written, spoken, video or multimodal form. <clears throat> Excuse me. And access to the advanced tools to discover, explore, exploit, annotate, analyze, combine them wherever they're located. Um, so we aim to give access to these things through a single sign-on environment um, that also serves as an ecosystem for knowledge exchange. And we've been working with the European Open Science Cloud, um, and so the facilities and platforms that we're, provide, we're preparing are um, kind of oven ready for integration in that. Um, it's a consortium of um, 21 members at the moment. Um, the way that ERICs work is that members are countries and most European countries have joined Clarin. Uh, each country has a Clarin consortium which mainly involves university departments and centres, also libraries, some national libraries. Um, and these give access to expertise in language technologies. So a lot of the heavy lifting is done by the centres which are repositories, for providers of research software, technical centres and other sorts of centres of expertise uh, in the Clarin countries and beyond. We've got members in the USA, South Africa and some non-member countries as well. Uh, Non-EU non countries can join, as May has already said. Uh, the UK is currently an observer, uh, which means we're not a full member, but we're actually moving towards full membership, um, paying the subscription almost to the level of full membership and it's a bit of a technicality at the moment that we're not full members. And basically people in the UK can um, operate and interact with Clarin as if we were full members in almost all circumstances. Martin, I'm sorry to interrupt. Are you able to move a bit closer to your mic? We're struggling to hear you a little bit. Okay, thanks for letting me know. Yeah, apologies. Um, I have Thank you. Some difficulty with the microphone. Um, is that better? Yeah, that's a little bit clearer. Thank you. Yeah, I can also um, just try boosting the level of the, uh, uh, of the microphone. Um, so the important part that I want to talk to you about today is um, what Clarin can do in respect of uh, Horizon Europe funding. Um, so... Um, Sorry, I've just boosted the microphone a bit. I hope that's a little better. Um, yeah, I think so. I'll continue trying to uh, speak up and, and speak clearly. Um, 
So I've only got time here to cover the main areas which are relevant and give you pointers to more information. There is a link at the end of this to where you can get this presentation and access to all of the links in it. And I'm very happy for the organizers to share the, uh, the, slide, uh, the slides. Um, so the first thing to say is that Clarin offers to help support and participate in projects involving digital language resources and technologies. So if there's anything in that kind of domain involved in your projects and your ideas, you might want to consider involving Clarin. As an official ERIC, Clarin's involvement can strengthen proposals in the eyes of the European Commission. Uh, this, is, this goes for all research infrastructures. And uh, we can present easy solutions for connectivity and sustainability. So Clarin will consider partnership to offer um, research infrastructure services um, possibly without additional funding. In certain circumstances, it would be appropriate for Clarin to come in as a partner in a consortium, but there are circumstances in which we can offer services and support without additional funding. There are certain activities that Clarin is already funded to do as a European research infrastructure, which we can offer without additional costs. Um, if we are a funded partner, though, we can delegate funded tasks to contracted third parties, which sounds a bit technical, but it does mean that uh, it is a way for um, institutions to get Horizon Europe money without being part of a formal part of a, uh, of a consortium and can reduce the, the overhead. Um, there are circumstances in which Clarin has come in as a partner uh, in a project and has then been able to find the best um, uh, the best organization from within its network to carry out the task and pass on uh, tasks to them and pass on the funding. Um, so Clarin is a partner in a number of projects. There's a link on the website to that. Um, Clarin also offers seed grants for preparing proposals. So you can go to Clarin and say, I'm putting forward this, uh, I'm putting together a, um, a Horizon Europe proposal, uh, which involves, uh, to a certain degree, digital language resources and technologies, and Clarin can offer to fund that, that activity. Um, there are also a number of areas in which Clarin already collaborates with Europeana, which may be of interest, and as I've already mentioned, uh, we're already involved with the European Open Science Cloud. Um, so yeah, next, next slide, please. Um, so we should be on the slide for Clarin and Open Science now. Yeah, I, I can't see them yet. Thank you. Um, so just to say fairly quickly about this, that Clarin is part of the Open Science Agenda, uh, promoting the reuse of data for research and promoting the, the FAIR uh, agenda, whereby uh, data should be findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. So including Clarin in a proposal can be a way to work towards these goals and indeed to, to tick that box uh, as far as the funders are concerned. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just a quick glance at the Clarin UK website to let you know that that's there and that's a good way to, good place to go to find out who's involved. So uh, Clarin UK is a fairly um, loose and informal structure where some of the key players in this domain have got together as a network. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and here's a list of some of the groups. Um, the, the consortium includes many of the main players in the UK in, in this domain. So the ways in which you can include Clarin in your proposal is via one of these centres who have expertise in language resources and technology. Um, via the Clarin Eric Direct um, by contacting them at the European level um, or one of the very many centres around Europe that are part of their national Clarin networks and consortiums. Or if that's a bit confusing, you can contact me to help you to find the best contact and the best way to, uh, uh, to talk to us about possible partnership or support. And next slide, uh, which is the final slide. So. Here are the key links which give you access to all the things that I've mentioned. Um, this presentation you can get from SlideShare um, and contains all of the links. So please contact me if you want to uh, uh, 
Uh, if, you, if you think this may be of interest to you, or indeed contact Clarin directly at the email address there. Uh, that's all from me, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Martin. I think that was actually a really nice, um, quite practical um, presentation of you know what what can be done um, uh, through Clarin. Um, and we do have one final presentation. I, I, I realize we're running a little bit out of um, kind of over time. So um, obviously, um, I am handing over to Frank um, from um, Operas. Um, but you know, if if you could keep it within um, ten minutes, that we that would be great, so that we still got some time for kind of questions or just general comments at the end. Yes, definitely, no problem. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, hello, my name is Frank Minister. I actually work for JISC, uh, but JISC has been an active participant in operas and indeed a founding member of it uh, several years ago. And we've also been quite active uh, in EOSC, uh, EOSC Pilot, EOSC Hub, uh, currently engaged with EOSC Future and EOSC Synergy. Um, my colleagues who are, are named here on this slide are also from JISC. They won't be presenting today, but they will be available for um, the Q&A. Um, so the next slide, please. So operas, uh, they, they, they do this funny thing. They, um, they, they, I think, come up with the word and then force the acronym to work. So it actually stands for Open Scholarly Communication in the European Research Area for Social Sciences and Humanities. Uh, and if you go, uh, and I'll be speaking about a number of things that you can find on their website, but that's their URL. Next slide, please. Uh, so one of the reasons for it uh, originally was the recognition of how fragmented uh, the humanities uh, can be. Uh, fragmented because of multilingualism, which again, it's not again, but it's, it's not a judgment, but that does obviously create uh, issues. Uh, fragmentation in disciplines, often linked to national and regional contexts and languages. Scarce visibility and re reuse fragmentation of sources and data in different types, formats, languages, disciplines, uh, and uh, the recognition that there was a lack of a single access point. Uh, and a myriad of small data, fragmentation in small and smart data, which should properly be qualified, described, managed, and curated. So next slide, please. So in terms of the mission, uh, it's really about integration of all these different things. So operas is the research infrastructure supporting openly open scholarly communication in the social sciences and the humanities in the European research area. Its mission is to coordinate and federate resources in Europe to efficiently address the scholarly communication needs of European researchers in the field of SSH. And we currently were just recently awarded the DMOS bid, uh, and, and a number of us partners will be working on that, which is focused on, on Diamond Open Access. The vision, OPERA's aim is to make open science a reality for research in the SSH and achieve a scholarly communication system where knowledge produced in the SSH benefits researchers, academics, students, and more generally, the whole society across Europe and worldwide without barriers. Um, and in terms of the value pro uh, proposition, really the underlying point there is, is the key thing, the entrenchment in diverse cultural backgrounds and the need for specific forms of scholarly communication, monographs, critical editions, and edited bi bibliographies amongst others. And by fulfilling its mission, Operas provides the research community with the missing brick. It needs to find, access, create, edit, disseminate, and easily and e efficiently validate SSH outputs across Europe. So again, coordinating the, the, and federating resources, giving authors the service they deserve, making open science a reality, discover, access, create, validate, and unlock resources. Next slide, please. And in terms of, of this slide, this just gives you a, a sense of where we are. Um, JISC is one of 10 core members, but there's actually 58 organizations who are part of uh, operas uh, and 17 countries. Uh, so it is very diverse, very welcoming, uh, very useful, and, and, and quite a, a pleasant place to go to. Uh, in terms of projects, you might have heard of Triple and Coeso. Those were um, operas projects. Uh, and in terms of the overall structure of the association, um, there are, there's the Opera Scientific Advisory Committee, there's the General Assembly, there's the Executive Assembly, and then there are seven special interest groups. So if people here are thinking about joining operas, they can also join a SIG as well, which would be very helpful. Next slide. 
So this is about the European Open Science Cloud. Um, I had to split it in two and going rather rapidly. And as I said, JISC has been involved in this, but as many partners here today have, have suggested, um, it's it's enormous uh, and and hopefully uh, will become something so beneficial to the to the to all of us. Next slide, please. So this is partly based on a webinar we produced um, about EOSC in the UK. We were asking questions about what should EOSC provide. Interoperability was one, persistent identifiers, access to data, and certainly quality metadata. And how could EOSC benefit you? There's training, there's collaboration, resources, and again, that interoperability, which is always part of FAIR in the first place. Next slide. So in terms of training, we looked at this, the, these seven areas, training in re for regional and in regional projects, um, EOSC infrastructure projects, EOSC thematic clusters, uh, training for institutions, uh, training for professional associations, global organizations, research infrastructures themselves, and then NRENs. Uh, next slide, sorry. And these are some of the task forces. Uh, many people, when they, they joined EOSC, were also then asked to join a task force, first writing up the charter, and then um, uh, perhaps generally uh, joining a different one. So JISC is a part of the PID policy and implementation, but there's also uh, researcher engagement and adoption, rules of participation and compliance, data stewardship, research careers recognition and credit, upskilling countries to engage in EOSC, and there's metadata and data quality with fair metrics and semantic interoperability, technical challenges on EOSC with AAI architecture, infrastructure for quality research software and technical interoperability, then financial sustainability and long-term data preservation. Next slide, please. And one of the things that we did in the webinar was uh, with Mentimeter, we asked, what would you like just to do to help your engagement with EOSC? And these were some of the things which uh, I, I can barely read, but I'll read them out. Clear explanation of what it is and who can use it. Facilitate opportunities for UK e-science and research computing centers and labs to contribute with funding to EOSC design, engineering, and implementation. Help us understand how EOSC fits with our local research support infrastructures linking JISC activities to those of EOSC future, keep informed about progress in Europe, and then finally support to onboard resources where relevant. Unsure what should be federated into, uh, into EOSC, only services that are freely available to all. And I have to say that in terms of the onboarding, I am a member of that task, uh, which is task 6.1, uh, and it is difficult. Um, we're, we're making a lot of progress, but it is one of the more difficult things and it, it, it surprised me how difficult it, it, it can be. Next slide, please. And here's, because um, I know these are going to be shared. These are contact details uh, for Dale, Matthew, Helen, and myself. And that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frank, um, and thanks for keeping um, to the time. Um, and obviously now we do have um, just, I think, five minutes in the allotted time. So obviously if someone does have any questions, please, um, I think we maybe have time for one or two. But I do hope that those presentations, I definitely learned a lot and I hope they kind of provided you with some ideas of perhaps how to go forward with a project idea and all the different, I guess, yeah, infrastructures and networks and um, platforms that are available um, to kind of utilize, I guess, um, in the ways that were indica indicated. Yeah, I don't know if there's any. We don't have any open questions. No, everything's um, been answered in the chat. I guess it is a, oh, a bit of an overwhelming situation, I guess, because there's been so many presentations and, you know, we don't have um, a lot of time. So I guess it, um, yeah, it can be a bit overwhelming. I understand that. Um, I think yeah, there's been some nice comments though in the in the chat. Um, so I think all the presentations have been really appreciated. I'm being told I looked scary when I leaned forward to read the slide. <laughs> Apologies. Yeah, it's, a shame. <laughs> it's a shame on Zoom that your own face is just so small and you yeah you don't really realize um you know what you look like. But you know I'm, I'm <laughs> sure it was fine. And on the recording, the 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 speaker um kind of um, boxes are very small, <laughs> so I don't think it won't be a problem. <laughs> Annie, will the chat be included in the recording as well? Um, the chat probably won't be included in the recording. Um, I think I can definitely think about sharing it. Um, I guess there is some kind of 
GDPR things that I, I would have to take into account. So I think um, you should be able to, if you do want the chat, probably the best bet would be to copy it now. I think you should be able to do that. I think I did enable that. Um, so if you did want to kind of take it all, um, I think that's that may be possible um, because just, yeah, I can't really promise that I will share it um, just because I'll, I'll have to check with the, um... oh, someone's able, not able to copy it, oh no. <laughs> um... There's a way, isn't there? If you go, if you go to the chat feature, um, there's three little dots on the right hand side. And if you click on that, it says you can save chat and that will okay. allow you to download it. Okay, yeah, because have... I think, yeah, I think it is, um, someone did point out that it probably won't be able, possible to share that. So, um, yeah. Unfortunately, that's the case, but you know, um, I hope you've been able to follow up, um, you know, with people who have been sharing their contact details. Um, yeah, I, I did. I did try to enable that um, option, but you know, yeah, unfortunately, um, <laughs> that might not have worked. Um, so I, I, I think it only works for hosts and panelists, Annie. Um, okay. But what I would say, if there's if there's someone within the chat who's posted a comment that you desperately want to get in contact with, you don't have their details, but you know their name. Just raise that with Annie and she'll see if she can put you in contact as well. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. That, that's true. That's a good point. And I think all, all the links that I've been posting in the chat as well, we can make sure that they go out in the email as well so you won't miss yeah. any of that as well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, as oh, I said, yeah, probably, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, be, I'll definitely be able to get those um, from the chat um, file. So that's completely fine. Um, no problem. Um, but I guess, you know, it's, it does seem like there probably won't be any uh, questions coming up and obviously we won't have much time to um, um, answer them either. So I think at this point, I just really want to thank all of, all of our speakers who I think, you know, did a great job in presenting, you know, information from different um, contexts and different, um, yeah, from, from all the different infrastructures and all the different um, projects that we see um, um, being presented. So that was, that was great. Um, and I don't know if Jamie, do you have any um, final comments? Yeah, I think just to say we've had over 200 attendees today, which is fantastic. I think that shows the level of enthusiasm and excitement and, and, and wants to collaborate between the UK and, and, and European partners, whether that's building on existing partnerships or new partnerships. I think we've shown you today both the exciting and success, successful projects that have been funded, but also the amazing breadth of networks and, and infrastructure and networks that there are for you all to tap into. Um, and please, if you just take one message away, is that the UK is still eager and excited to be involved in Horizon Europe and we want to continue to do so so please get in touch with Annie get in touch with partners and we look forward to success if not next in this year's calls remember there's another five years worth coming up as well yeah that's very true um and just I do have one final comment as well when when you do click off the event um there should be um kind of a survey that comes up um, and if you did have kind of I think it'll probably take a few minutes to answer I think there are seven questions um so you know we can obviously use that then to kind of see how useful this event was and to inform um how we design future events and so that would be very um, very useful to us um but i think yeah otherwise um i guess it is almost um 3 30 um actually it's just turned now so i think we could yeah probably close now but i yeah again wanted to really thank everyone who's taken part and all the um great speakers and that's definitely very very great comments um, in the chat. So I think it's been very appreciated. Um, so yeah, I really wanted to thank everyone um, for their contributions and for taking part. And I hope to see you all um, in the future <laughs> in some capacity. Brilliant. Thanks everybody, see you soon. Thanks Annie and Jamie and Emma. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>